stop this uh, threat posted by the cyber criminals. We have to remember that it is not only the technology that makes our life easier, but we have to consider also the threat that is being brought by the cybercrime. It is also nice to know and to understand the global perspective of the cybercrime. And we are fortunate enough that we able to invite uh, we able to invite one of the experts in the field of cyber crime investigation. So once again, uh, just sit back and enjoy and hope that you will learn matters pertaining to cyber crime investigation, considering that it is one of the competencies that you must possess, being a criminology student and soon to be the future vanguards of justice. Once again, good morning and welcome to the cyber crime investigation seminar part two. We are now global. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Kailing, for that warm welcome. So without further ado, let us proceed to the direction, Sati, and rationale of the seminar. May I call on our very own Dean of Northeastern Mindanao College's College of Criminal Justice Education, Dr. Edwin T. Montalba. Thank you, uh, John Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as the Dean of the College of Criminal Justice Education of this uh, prestigious institution, I am delighted <clears throat> to welcome you all to this uh, seminar on cybercrime investigation. Uh, today, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Uh, Kevin W. Jennings, an associate professor at Lincoln Memorial University, and then, of course, expert in the field of cybercrime investigation. Um, cybercrime is a growing threat to society. And as the technology continues to evolve, so to do the challenges associated with investigating and preventing it. So the purpose of this seminar is, of course, to provide our criminology students, particularly the graduating students, with a a uh, comprehensive understanding of the latest trends and challenges associated with cybercrime on a global scale. I know for sure that during the seminar, uh, Dr. Jennings will share his valuable insights into the world of cyber cybercrime investigation, um, exploring the latest trends and challenges associated with this uh, from uh, with this form of criminal activity so our speaker of course will provide the students with an opportunity to learn about the latest tools and techniques used by investigators to identify investigate and prevent cybercrime so basically, this seminar is designed to be informative, to be engaging and interactive. So our students will have the opportunity to interact with Dr. Jennings and gain valuable insights into the challenges and opportunities presented by cybercrime. So therefore, may I urge our students to take advantage of this unique opportunity to learn from an expert in the field of cybercrime investigation. I am very confident that this seminar will provide you, will provide our students with a strong foundation in the subject matter and equip them with the necessary knowledge and skills to tackle the challenges associated with cybercrime. To end my a short message, I would like to Thank Dr. Jennings for taking the time to share his expertise with us and our students. And I would like also to grab this opportunity in saying thank you to Chapter House Publishing Company under the leadership of our beloved Dr. Winston John Casio for sponsoring this noble academic endeavor. And of course, to everyone in attendance for their interest in this 
important topic. Again, good morning and may God God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Montalba, for the detailed rationalization for today's seminar workshop. To proceed, may I call on Jack, Sir Jack Bird D. Mendoza, DEM, candidate, Deputy Executive Training Director of PCD Training Center Incorporated, to introduce our keynote speaker for today's seminar workshop. Hello, good morning to one and all. Our resource speaker for today is Dr. Jennings. He graduated from Texas State University with a PhD in criminal justice in 2014 and is now an associate professor at Lincoln Memorial University. He is also the director of the undergraduate program in criminal justice at the Lincoln Memorial University. His research and teaching career focuses on cybercrime, digital forensics, and police use of technology. Let's welcome our resource speaker, Dr. Kevin Jennings. Good morning, sir. Good morning, or uh, in, in my time zone, it's very much evening at this point. But uh, wow, you guys really built me up a lot. I don't know if I can live up to that. Um, you guys are uh, so kind and, and so... Uh, uh, lovely to invite me here. And um, as I'm trying to get my screen shared, I want to ask uh, Professor Kaling, I, I got 170, 180 participants right now. How do you do it? Like, holy cow, I, there's no way I could get that many students into a, into a, 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 a presentation like this. I mean, you must be really, um, really good teacher. How do I, where's share screen? I'm not used to this, um, Stop that. No, show captions, record. I have a whole uh, PowerPoint presentation, but I'm not seeing the usual share screen there at the top. Hi, Dr. Jennings, I have already promoted you to become the, the host so that you can uh, share your screen or your yeah, PowerPoint. How? I'm not seeing the, the, oh, there it is, share screen. Sorry, uh, I got it. All right, you guys seeing what I'm seeing? Yes, sir. All right, good. So this is, uh, uh, you know, the the title chosen um, by Professor Kaling. And um, there's a picture of me back when I had a lot more hair. Uh, but that was right at the beginning of my teaching career. And I tell my students every time they turn in a bad paper, one of my hairs falls out. So, you know, I don't have too many left. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, take a lot of uh, uh, time and effort to work on your uh, uh, papers there because, you know, professors, we got to, you know, we got to hold on to this, you know? All right. So um, it, the cyber is becoming more and more and more important as time goes on, right? Um, I remember back in the 90s when I was like the only kid on my block that had a computer, but now everybody's got a computer. Right. Um, and I think in the intro, uh, somebody said um, there are two billion Internet users. Well, the numbers I got and I, I, I double check these today numbers, I got say four point six billion Internet users, which, you know, if we've got roughly eight billion people on the planet, that's more than half. So we got a lot of people uh, 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 being there online with some kind of Internet connected device. Sometimes it's a computer, sometimes it's a laptop, sometimes it's a, a smartphone. Um, in my last house, I had a, my, my air conditioning thermostat was connected to the internet. Um, but we're getting more and more and more devices, right? 85% uh, of Americans own some kind of smartphone. I was one of the last of them. I, I, had, a, I had an old school flip phone until about uh, oh, 2010, I think, was it when I got my first smartphone. Uh, China and India each have over a billion mobile phone users. I mean, that's a lot. That's a one followed by like, I don't know, a heck of a lot of zeros. Uh, and kind of the, the saddest part is that 70% of American adults use social media. And most of them don't know how to do it, which kind of annoys the heck out of me. But, you know, that's a personal problem, not a crime problem. So, you know, we can skip over that part. 
<clears throat> All right, so one of the big lessons about cybercrime and internet behavior and and all these um, uh, 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 cybercrime discussions, one of the big themes, one of the things that I want all the cybercrime students to walk away kind of understanding is that technology changes behavior. People are completely different when they're online versus when they're in person, right? You know, in person, uh, I'm a real nice guy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very collegiate and, and welcoming and, um, you know, just uh, I'll run up to you and give you a hug. Uh, when I get online, if I see somebody misspell a word, I turn into a jerk, right? Oh, you misspelled that, you know. And it's there's a lot of reasons for that, but but uh, essentially the the separation we have as people between a computer screen and then the internet and then another computer screen and the other person that physical separation between us and others uh, removes a lot of the socialization process that we got all through our lives, right? So how we use technology as a culture, as a people, as a, as a species even, uh, is referred to as our technic ways, right? Um, not, not a huge term in the field yet, but some of the people are using it and I'm trying to kind of promote its use. But the technic ways are, are ways of uh, adapting to and using technology, right? And one of the things we're having to deal with uh, uh, you know, kind of in this generation is uh, there's a giant monumental difference between the people that grew up with this technology and the people that came into this technology later in life, right? Um, I don't know how old you guys are. I'm assuming you're, you know, typical American college age, so late teens, early 20s kind of age. Um, so you grew up with this stuff. You grew up with the internet. You grew up with, with uh, you know, constant connectivity and, and computers and things like that. Whereas, you know, my generation, I remember when you had to hang a phone like on the wall and it was connected to a cord. And if you wanted to call somebody, you had to call their house and be like, hey, is Bobby there? Um, so I'm kind of the, the youngest of what I call the digital immigrants, right? The people who came into technology later in life. Whereas you guys, you're firmly in the digital native category where you grew up with this stuff. And thus, your generation has a much, much, much different perspective on technology and computers and acceptable behavior and methods of communication than we digital immigrants do. I didn't get my first computer until I was so oh, nine or 10 years old. And even then it was, you know, I mean, you kids today, you'd look at it and be like, that's even a computer? My watch has more power than that thing. Um, but, you know, I could play video games on it, so I loved it. Um, and I've been into computers ever since, which is kind of how I got into the, the place I am now, right? But unfortunately, while most of us, including me, would never, ever commit a crime with a computer, uh, you can tell my lawyer I said that, um, there are people who are going to use computers for criminal purposes, right? We've got all these people. Uh, uh, and if you're a criminal, you see the four point whatever billion people I said on the two couple of slides ago, and you think, oh my God, there's a lot of victims or a lot of potential victims, right? I'm going to go out there. I'm going to, uh, you know, use my technology skills and I'm going to commit some crimes and, um, uh, 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 use this as a tool for me to now do my criming even better, right? And there's kind of three ways that computers can be involved in a uh, any kind of crime, right? And uh, the one we usually think of when we think of computer crime is the one I have here in the middle on this screen, where it's uh, the computer as a tool, right? And this is, you know, the traditional kinds of cyber crime we think of this is you know hacking and and viruses and uh you know all that kind of uh, fancy schmancy uh cyber crimey stuff that they show in the movies and they show in the on the news and all those things but you can also use it for a lot of other things like communication right 
if you're going to be involved in any kind of criminal conspiracy, whether it's, you know, trying to murder a politician or, or all the way down to selling drugs or, uh, you know, even robbing a bank, right? You need to communicate. You need to, to talk to the other people in your little conspiracy. And that might, might be one other person, might be hundreds of other people. You don't know. And one of the things computers do really, really well is communicate. I mean, we're having this conversation right now across literally 12 times. You guys are on the opposite side of the earth and you're listening to me talk. Uh, we're exactly 12 hours off. So it's, you know, 9.27 p.m. here. You guys are in the future, right? It's 9.27 Friday morning there. So if you guys could look at the um, at the, the lottery numbers and send those to me before you go to, uh, before you, uh, before I go to bed so I can buy a, a lottery ticket, that'd be great. But computers are amazing at communication. And that could be phone calls. It could be text messages. It could be Facebook Messenger. It could be WhatsApp. It could be Zoom. It could be any of these processes. But computers are really good at, at letting criminals communicate with each other, right? And the third one I got listed there is as an incidental device, right? So maybe the computer has nothing to do with the crime itself. Maybe I'm selling drugs out of my back porch, right? But I keep a spreadsheet on my computer about, you know, how many drugs I sold to Billy and he, he still owes me 50 bucks and I bought a kilo of cocaine from Big Johnny and, you know, I owe him a thousand, you know, I could keep records on my computer of these crimes I'm committing where the computer itself, the, the, the information contained on the computer has absolutely nothing to do with the crime. But since I used it as a tool to re record my drug sales, you know, it's it's a piece of evidence. It's something the, the police need to find, need to access, need to investigate, get all that evidence off of. Uh, and then we're going to, you know, use that in court because it makes really, really good evidence. Juries love this stuff, right? Uh, or it could be just my cell phone in my pocket, right? One of my favorite stories of stupid criminals, and stupid criminals is kind of a, a, a theme in most of my lectures. Um, uh, I'm assuming we've all taken some kind of crim theory course where, you know, why do people commit crime, right? And there's learning theory and there's labeling theory. Well, I'm going to become famous because I'm going to publish Kevin's super awesome theory of crime, which basically says people commit crime because they're stupid. And I include myself in that. I include everybody. We all act stupid at some points. Most of us hopefully never get stupid enough to commit a crime and especially not stupid enough to get then get caught for it. But uh, there were a couple of high school kids here in the United States that decided to break into their high school, you know, and they wore masks. So they knew they were cameras. Right. So they wore masks and and broke into the high school and did a bunch of vandalism and and, um, you know, broke some stuff and spray painted stuff all over the walls. But importantly, they had their cell phones on. And their cell phones would automatically connect to the school's Wi-Fi network. So when the, you know, the principal and the teachers arrive the next day, they show up and they're like, oh, my God, somebody's vandalized the school. Police showed up and they were bright enough to think, hey, let's check the Wi-Fi logs. And they saw that these kids were logged in to the school's Wi-Fi at like three in the morning. So then they got caught like that. No problem, because they forgot to disable their cell phones or leave their cell phones at home or something. So that's where, where cyber crime and the technology and all those things mix um, and become a, a, a just a completely incidental, but very, very important part of the criminal act. All right. Everybody with me? Everybody still good? All right. So what makes crime online or 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 crime utilizing the internet or crime utilizing computers somehow uh, very attractive. What makes cybercrime kind of uh, good for the criminals, right? Well, the first thing is anonymous communication, right? Um, it is really difficult to track people's communication on the internet, whether that's a, a phone call, um, a Zoom call, uh, WhatsApp, any of those things. It's not impossible, but it's a lot more difficult for police to figure out who's talking to who. You know, we might catch one guy involved in the crime, 
but then we can't figure out who any of his co-conspirators are because he only talked with them using, you know, fancy encrypted communications. So it becomes a little more challenging, but still not impossible to kind of track down who's communicating with who and who everybody is and all those things. Uh, the dark web. The dark web is um, a part of the internet uh, that you, as lovely law-abiding students, never want to go to. The dark web is essentially, um, it's all the, it's, think like websites, just like, you know, your university has a website and there's, you know, Disney.com and I don't know what websites you go to. Uh, Facebook, right? It's just like that, except it's not indexed by Google. It's not indexed by any search engine. So you, if you want to go there, you have to know where you're going ahead of time. You can't kind of just stumble upon it, right? Um, but in that dark web, uh, uh, that's where you can find websites to buy drugs and guns and, um, you know, all that illegal stuff. You can buy credit card numbers. You can, you know, all that fancy uh, illegal stuff that you need a website for, you, you do that on the dark web because it, it, it makes it a lot more difficult for law enforcement to see, makes it more difficult to be tracked. Um, it's a lot more difficult to even figure out where these websites are being hosted, right? Are they, you know, is this website actually in the United States? Is it in the Philippines? Is it in China? We don't know. It's a lot more difficult to tell where any of these things are coming from. Another thing that makes computer crime uh, fancy is cryptocurrency, right? I'm assuming we've all heard of Bitcoin. Yeah, the big, and that's kind of the big name cryptocurrency, um, but it's essentially a digital only currency, right? So if I wanna send a bunch of money to somebody because I'm buying drugs for them or from them, I should say, I don't wanna pay in US dollars or Philippine pesos or any other kind of currency that's tracked because my bank's going to keep a record and you know they're going to have some kind of a, a you know a paper trail but with bitcoin because it's kind of online only and decentralized and there's no bank in charge there's no government in charge um it becomes a lot more difficult to track again like communication it's not impossible but it's a heck of a lot more difficult and bitcoin's not the only cryptocurrency there's a bunch of other ones out there the second most popular one behind Bitcoin is called Ethereum. But then there's, a, you know, dozens and maybe even hundreds at this point of other kinds of cryptocurrencies, Tezos and Algorand and, you know, there's a gazillion of them. Uh, another thing that makes cybercrime kind of attractive is the subculture, right? So we all know kind of what a culture is, right? We, you know, I got one culture here in Tennessee. Um, which is kind of a weird subset of the larger American culture. You guys have Philippine culture, uh, which has a lot of overlap with American culture, uh, although not nearly as much as uh, Tennessee does. Um, but but these cultures, you know, it's this special set of values and norms and, and even language, right? And with cybercrime, there's one of these subcultures. They have their own special culture within the larger culture where people have a way of talking to each other and a, a way of um, doing things and thinking about things and talking about things that is similar to but significantly different from the larger culture that they're coming from. Because again, computer crime is worldwide and thus they take a, you know, a little bit from all these other cultures and then they have their own kind of like, like um, is stealing okay? Well, in normal, both American and Philippine culture, of course, stealing is wrong. But in the online subculture, there's some situations where, no, stealing is okay. It's morally acceptable, right? Um, and one of the things that makes that kind of powerful uh, is learning theory, right? Again, as I said on the last slide, I, I'm assuming all of you guys have taken some kind of crim theory course, you know, a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, what crim theory says, you know, it's again, they're just all kind of trying to answer why do people commit crime? And with learning theory, learning theory basically says you learn from those around you, your peers. 
uh, not only the methods to commit crime and the processes to use to commit crime, but also kind of the moral values that say that committing this kind of crime is okay or expected or normal, right? So if you're hanging out with a bunch of other computer criminals, you're gonna see computer crime as more normal, more expected, more uh, uh, not out of the ordinary. So you're gonna commit more computer crime, right? All right, so what makes it difficult for us, the good guys, you know, we're, we're trying to investigate this stuff. We're trying to know more about it. We're trying to catch the bad guys. What makes it difficult for us? Well, one of the things is uh, the, the required technical knowledge for how to commit cybercrime has plummeted over my lifetime, right? So back in the 80s and the 90s, you really needed some technical knowledge to be able to commit cybercrimes. You needed to know how to you know, code uh, uh, you know, with uh, programming languages. You needed to know um, how computers worked on a really kind of detailed technical level. But these days, if you want to commit a crime, you just you know, need email. And everybody's got that, right? So the, the amount of technical knowledge that it takes to become a cyber criminal is a tiny fraction of what it used to be. And that has allowed more and more and more and more criminals to kind of get into the world of cybercrime. Uh, it's, it's become more accessible because you don't need to have a computer science degree. You don't need to have grown up with computers. You don't need to kind of play with them and understand them and build your own and do all these technical things to get to the point where you understand computers well enough to commit these cyber crimes. Now you can just do it, you know, five minutes of Googling, figuring it out, right? Uh, many years ago, I decided I wanted to learn how to crack passwords. You know, if I get a bunch of people and their password, I want to learn how to break into uh, people's password protected stuff. And it took me like a couple of hours with Google and a program I downloaded for free and messing around with it and trying to figure it out. And in a couple of hours, I got pretty good at breaking passwords. It's that easy, right? Another thing you got to worry about is deviance versus crime, right? So deviance and crime are both bad. They're both things that society looks down on. They're both things that we say, hey, you shouldn't do that. But not all deviance is criminal, right? So like, um, I don't know about the laws of the Philippines, but here in the United States, if I cheat on my wife and I have a girlfriend and I'm sleeping with her, that's not a crime. It's definitely deviant. I would get kind of shamed by my culture for doing it, but it's not a crime. Same thing on the computer, right? So there are certain activities on a computer that are definitely deviant, but does that necessarily make them a crime, right? So depending on the jurisdiction, the country you're in, even the state you're in, um, uh, uh, something might be kind of bad and wrong, but it's not necessarily a crime. And so police have to be really kind of up to date and knowledgeable about where that line is. Where does it go from being frowned upon to being illegal? And that's not always as clear cut as it kind of should be, right? And jurisdiction has a lot of other problems too, you know? Um, just here in the United States, right? If I'm in Tennessee and somebody in California commits a cyber crime that's not against federal law, but it is against state law, which state has to do what, right? So the victims in Tennessee, the offenders in California, maybe even the, the servers that was hosting the, the computer where the crime actually occurred is in Washington. Which of those three jurisdictions is the one to investigate and arrest and try and prosecute and punish for that offense? If it's a federal law violation, it gets a little simpler. But if it's only a state law violation, and what if it's illegal in Tennessee, but not illegal in California where the offender was? Now what? Because they broke Tennessee law, can Tennessee you know, send a police officer down to California and arrest them, it gets real complicated. And then when you get international, 
it gets even exponentially more complicated. Because right now, there's a lot of countries where certain things are illegal, or, or I should say, where certain things are legal, but they're illegal in the United States. So if somebody commits a crime with a victims in the United States, but the offender is in a country where that was legal, can the United States do anything legally about it? That's, that's a, a question for international lawyers, of which I am not an international lawyer. Um, but the last thing on here, hacking groups. So a lot of hackers, a lot of computer criminals, they don't commit crimes by themselves. They have buddies, they have pals, they have gangs, right? Um, and hacking groups, you know, the most famous one is just called Anonymous, although they haven't been in the news much lately. Um, but there are computer hacking groups all over the place. Um, and they work together to commit these crimes. So they could have one person trying to do this part of the crime and one person trying to do that part of the crime. And maybe one person shows up like at the facility they're trying to hack into in person to try to, you know, distract people or, or obtain information from the trash can outside or whatever. But these groups working together are much better and more effective than the individuals would be on their own, right? So when they team up like that, uh, even if the individual members of the group are in many different countries, many different states, lots of different physical locations, and a lot of times what you'll find is they don't even know where the other people are, right? There'll be 10 people in a hacking group and nobody knows where the other nine live. Like I know I live in Florida in the United States, but the other nine people, who knows? Maybe one of them lives in the UK and one of them lives in China and one of but we don't talk about that kind of thing. We keep that kind of thing a secret so that if one of us is ever arrested by law enforcement, not only do we not give up the others, we're literally incapable because we don't know anything about the others, right? Does that make sense? Now, other things that make cybercrime kind of attractive to, to the bad guys, right? Uh, what? Why is cybercrime so prosperous? Why is it so rampant? Why is it so uh, uh, easy? Well, for one thing, lower costs, right? Um, if I want to try to con somebody about, out of a bunch of money, I could fly to where they live, buy a suit, pretend to be a banker, but that's expensive, right? Whereas if I'm online, I can sit in my living room and, and pretend to be somebody I'm not, and it doesn't cost me a dime. I'm already paying for internet access. This doesn't cost me anything more, right? It's also a force multiplier. And by that, I mean, you know, if I'm trying to, uh, you know, scam a huge number of people, if I have to like write out a bunch of letters, put them in an envelope and send it via the postal service, you know, I can only do what, maybe a couple of hundred a day? But with email, I could send out millions of emails in 30 seconds. So one person can, can contact and uh, attempt to scam or uh, attempt to uh, con uh, exponentially more people than one person just, you know, kind of in the physical world, right? It's also really attractive because there's a really low risk of detection. People just, you know, there's a ridiculous number of cyber crimes happening every day. But almost none of them ever get caught. So if you're a cyber criminal, uh, your chances of being arrested are tiny, teeny tiny, like single digit percent. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them are things like proxies, okay? Proxies are computers uh, that are kind of between you and your victim. So if I wanted to hack into, um, you know, the, the Na NASA, I want to hack into NASA's computers and find the plans for the latest rocket that they built, right? What I can do is if I go through a proxy in China, right? I find a, a proxy computer in China and I go from me to China to NASA. And then if NASA figures out what I'm trying to do and says, hey, who's this guy trying to connect 
to our machine trying to break in and try to find these plans for this new rocket, if they trace that connection back, they're just going to see a computer in China. And they're not able to then follow it back from that computer in China back to me, right? So now imagine instead of doing that one proxy in China, I do, you know, from me here in Tennessee to a proxy in China, to a proxy in Russia, to a proxy in Brazil, to a proxy in Ukraine, then to NASA. Now they got to go through all those different proxies. And if, you know, they might be able to show up physically in person, find the the, the proxy server and, and look at its records and figure out where did the connection to that server was coming from. But then, you know, if I'm behind four or five or six of them, that's going to take them a heck of a long time. And at least one of the governments involved in that, in those countries is going to say, mm, no, we're not going to cooperate. We're not going to help you. We're not going to kind of investigate this server because we don't like you. So those, that kind of protection for the criminal makes it a heck of a lot less likely that they're going to be kind of investigated, prosecuted. There's also just a lack of reporting. So many people are victims of cybercrime and never report it to the police. And a lot of times it's because they don't even know they were a victim, right? So anybody out there got a credit card, right? You could have been a victim already. Somebody's got your credit card number and it's for sale on a dark web website and somebody's buying it right now for five bucks. And now they have your credit card number or a driver's license number, a passport number, whatever. And they're going to make a fake passport with your name and their photo. And you would have no idea. So, of course, if you have no idea you're a victim, you can't report it to the police. And thus they can't investigate it. And thus nobody's going to get arrested for it. Right. But even if I know I'm a victim or a potential victim or had a crime attempted against me, a lot of times I'm not going to report it. Like I get scam emails all the time, right? But I never report any of them to the police because, you know, these things are, are routine at this point. I'm not going to report it to the police because the police aren't going to do anything. I, you know, somebody sent me a scam email. Luckily, I didn't fall for it. Police aren't going to investigate that. They don't have the time or energy or money to investigate that kind of thing. And the last thing that makes cybercrime attractive that I got on this slide is a lack of laws against it. There are a lot of countries where stuff is just legal. And because the internet works the way it does, I can go to that, you know, a server hosted in that country, do that thing that's illegal where I come from. But because the server's hosted in a country where it is legal, uh, Nobody cares. Nobody investigates it. Nobody prosecutes it, right? So there are still, to this day, countries in the world where you can have, you know, child porn or, uh, you know, digital piracy, completely legal, right? So that kind of lack of good, up-to-date, uh, unified um, uh, laws and, and criminal codes makes it a lot more difficult to catch and prosecute the bad guys if they do it right. Which luckily for us, most of the people are stupid and they do it wrong. But if they do it right, it makes it real, real, real attractive, real difficult um, to investigate and prosecute and do all those things, right? So back in 2001, kind of the early days of cybercrime, uh, this researcher named Wall decided to create a, a typology of computer crime. Right. So what are the different kinds of crime you can commit with a computer? And again, this is ignoring uh, the kinds of crime where a computer is incidental or computer computer was used for communication for a normal crime. Right. You know, robbing a bank, selling drugs, et cetera, et cetera. These are types of crimes committed with a computer where the computer is kind of central to the crime. Right. And Wall created these four categories, cyber trespass cyber deception and theft, cyber porn and obscenity, and cyber violence. Okay, and we're gonna talk about each one of these in turn, but essentially what Wall is saying is that all the crimes committed with computers, again, ignoring the ones where they're incidental or used for communication, for bank robberies or drug selling or whatever, 
the crimes really committed with and, and by and for computers fall into one of these four categories, all right? Now, the first one of these is cyber trespass. This is where you kind of cross boundaries into computers or systems or networks that you're not supposed to be in, right? And this is one of the favorites of hackers, especially the old school hackers from like the 80s, 90s. They really, you know, they weren't so much interested in profiting off of their crimes. They were just interested in kind of the, you know, the thrill of it and the bragging rights and access to information, stuff like that, right? So these guys would break into computers not to steal things for money, but to steal things they wanted to know or wanted to understand better, or just to be able to brag like, hey, check this out. I broke into you know, the United States Department of Justice's computer system and get kind of street cred with their buddies. So, but cyber trespass is really just accessing information you're not supposed to have access to. And in the modern day, most of the time, this is for some kind of financial gain, right? Which we'll talk about financial gain here in a minute. Um, so it kind of bridges two different categories. Um, but, you know, if I break into NASA's computer system for the latest rocket designs, that's a cyber trespass. And I wouldn't want the rocket design for, for money. I'm not going to sell it to some foreign government or anything. I just want to know how the thing works. I'm a huge NASA nerd. I love rockets. I love space flight. I want to know how it works. And so if I break into their computer system and steal those plans, uh, that would fall definitely under this category. One of the things you got to worry about, though, is who owns it? Because it's not always so simple, right? My computer that I'm broadcasting from here is definitely mine, right? I paid for it. It's in my house. But, you know, I have a cloud account with Google, uh, Google, uh, Google Drive, right? If somebody breaks into a Google server and accesses my information, is that information owned by me? Is it owned by Google? Is it owned by, you know, it's a little murkier, right? Now let's say it's one central computer at your university and each student has a little chunk of space on that computer. It can become a lot more difficult to figure out whose space is whose. Is it a fellow students? Is it yours? Is it the university's, right? So figuring out who owns what gets a little murky in these situations. Now, the second category is cyber detection, deception and theft. And this is much more of kind of what we think of here in 2023, okay? This is what people are, are trying to do. This is a, a, a big focus on cybercrime because of the four, this one is the one that has grown the most. This is the one that has kind of become such a huge problem when it comes to cybercrime. And this is where you're kind of illegally taking something from somebody else, right? And there's tons of examples of this. Three of the ones I chose to put on this slide are, are the first one on there is phishing, right? And because cyber criminals are cyber criminals, they don't want to spell it the way that you'd spell phishing, like, you know, with a pole and, and you know, catching a fish. They spell it slightly differently just so they can seem cool, right? And, and in cybercrime, what phishing is, I'm sure you've gotten emails like this. You ever get an email from like, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know what the bank companies are in, in the Philippines, but you get a, an email from some bank and it says, hey, your account's about to be suspended. There's suspicious activity. Click this link and then input your username and password so that we can verify you're really you and if you don't do that, your account's going to get shut down in two days, right? That's a phishing email. They're trying to trick you. You know, it's not actually from your bank. They're trying to trick you into giving the bad guys uh, your username and password. And once you do that, because you're afraid, oh, my God, I don't want to lose my bank, bank account. If you fall for it, you send them your username and password. They'll say, oh, thank you very much. We verified your identity. No problem. And they're going to use your username and password to drain your bank account, right? So that's phishing. Maybe it's bank account info. Maybe it's your password to your university's website because they want to, you know, attack your university. Uh, if you're working for a company, maybe they need your username and password to, 
you know, commit some larger cyber crime against your company. Um, in 2016, during the United States presidential election, the head of the uh, campaign for one of our two major candidates for that presidential election uh, fell for a phishing attack. And the bad guys got their access to their email account and then found a bunch of emails that made that candidate look really bad. And that candidate ended up losing the election. And it was probably, I mean, you know, I can't say what would have happened if, if this phishing attack hadn't been successful, but I'm betting that that phishing attack was a huge part of why that candidate lost that election. So literally a phishing attack changed the winner of the presidency of the United States. That's a huge thing, right? Then of course there's fraud. And there's all kinds of different frauds out there. Uh, you know, if you selling stuff uh, on eBay or, or uh, you know, I don't know what the, uh, isn't the um, Alibaba is the big uh, uh, selling market website in, uh, in Asia, I think, right? Um, but, but whenever you sell something, maybe the seller uh, uh, sends you either no goods at all or fake goods after they've gotten their money, right? So I used to work at a digital forensics lab and one of the cases we worked was somebody selling gold coins. You know, it was like one troy ounce gold coins that he was selling for, I don't know, whatever gold was worth at the time. Um, and then some of the people kind of quickly figured out that this isn't gold, this is a lead coin that's been plated in gold. So it's worth like five bucks. So we had to investigate and prosecute this fraud uh, that somebody was committing on the internet. And then of course there's piracy, right? And by piracy, I don't mean like our mateys, let's raise the mizzen mast and we're gonna shoot cannons at that ship over there. No, I mean, piracy is in digital piracy, as in illegally downloading movies and music and television shows and software and video games and all those things um, where normally you'd have to pay for it but uh, you know, you download it illegally, you get it for free, which is attractive for what I hope is obvious reasons, but it's still illegal in most countries. And again, there's tons more examples of cyber deception and theft. This is just kind of some of the big ones. Now, cyber porn and obscenity. One of the difficult things here is it's really, really, really highly dependent on the laws of the different jurisdictions you're in. Right. So in some countries, um, you can make pornography that's perfectly legal. But as soon as you walk over that geographic boundary, now that exact same thing is totally illegal. Right. Um, sometimes it's the age of the actor. You know, uh, here in the United States, uh, you have to be 18. It's a federal law. So it's it's true across the entire country. You got to be 18 to do any kind of pornography as an actor or actor. Um, in other countries, it's 16, right? So one of the challenges, again, going back to a couple of slides ago, is if somebody makes some pornography at the age of 16 in a country where that's legal, and then somebody downloads it or views it in the United States, can they be prosecuted for that? Because where that thing was made, it's perfectly legal but in the United States, it's not, right? Um, so this gets real kind of, what's illegal, what's legal uh, is really kind of up in the air, depending on exactly what piece of dirt you're standing on at that time. Now in the United States, there's really three different kinds of pornography that, that are illegal, right? And the most obvious one, of course, child porn. If you're under 18, and you star in some kind of pornographic picture, video, whatever, that's illegal. It's illegal for you to make it. It's illegal for other people to view it. It's illegal for other people to have it anywhere on their computer. Uh, the federal government does not mess around with this, right? This is like the fastest way to prison in the United States is to have some kind of pornography made by somebody under the age of 18. I, they don't care if, if the person is 17 years and 364 days old. You're under 18, this is a straight to jail, right? Um, another one that until very recently, a lot of states didn't have laws against it is revenge porn, okay? Now with revenge porn, luckily, thankfully, very recently, 
Uh, we finally finished it off, and this is illegal in all 50 states. But each state law is slightly different as to what exactly constitutes revenge porn, what's legal, what's illegal. So it still depends exactly where you're standing on how this works and what exactly is revenge porn versus what isn't. But at least some form of it is illegal in all 50 states now, which is very good. I hope it's illegal in the Philippines because it's really bad. But basically with revenge porn, what happens is, you know, guy and a girl are dating, guy and girl, you know, send each other naked pictures because, you know, they're doing the whole dating thing and, oh, here's me, hey, click, right? And then you send that. Um, and then uh, they break up, right? Because no relationship or most relationships don't last forever. So, you know, eventually uh, a lot of us break up. Um, uh, me and my wife are never going to break up, I promise. But, uh, you know, I had a lot of ex-girlfriends from before I met my wife and we broke up. And some of them I'm still friends with to this day. Some of them I had really bad breakups. And I'm really glad I had those bad breakups long before the Internet became a thing, because with bad breakups, you know, in the modern day, if you've ever sent, you know, those those racy pictures to each other, uh, somebody's really upset at the other person. I can't believe they did that. How dare they break up with me? Blah, blah, blah. Then they take those photos of their ex significant other and they post them all over the internet in order to kind of shame the other person. And again, luckily that's now illegal in all 50 states in some form or another. I hope it's illegal in, in the Philippines. Um, but that kind of uh, revenge porn and getting back at somebody like that, uh, really bad. I've, I've, I've known people that have been victims of this and it's, it's crushing. And of course there's bestiality, which is, uh, how do I put this lightly? It's pornography involving animals, which uh, you'd be, you know, this is the weird stuff, right? And this luckily, thankfully, is also illegal here in the United States. And again, I hope illegal in the Philippines. But the vast majority of the crimes that fall under this category are one of those three. There might be other countries where there's kind of additional uh, uh parts to this, additional crimes, additional uh, ways that this kind of uh, category of cybercrime could be described, but those are kind of the big three. And then of course, the fourth category, cyber violence. Okay, and this is cybercrime that's injurious, hurtful, dangerous, right? This is where you're actually hurting somebody. And the three common ones here are bullying, stalking, and harassment. Now, I can hear a lot of you thinking in your heads, you know, that's not really violence, right? That's not, that's not uh, you know, like punching somebody in the face. But I can tell you many, many years ago, I had a cyber stalker and this person uh, stalked me all over the internet, found out all kinds of personal details from different things I had posted on different websites. And it was horrible. It was emotionally taxing. I couldn't sleep. I didn't eat. Like I was afraid for my life. That is absolutely hurtful and injurious and dangerous. And, and it was really horrible time in my life when I had this cyber stalker. And luckily he, he lost interest in me many, many years ago. Um, but I wouldn't want to go through that again for a million dollars. So bullying and stalking and harassment, and often there's a, there's a lot of overlap between those three, but any one of them, let alone all three of them, is really hurtful emotionally, physically, mentally, all those things. Um, and so it's absolutely uh, violence uh, in the traditional sense of the term. Once you kind of think about really the, the short-term and long-term effects of being a victim of that kind of crime. But then the even more obvious kind of cyber violence is terrorism. It is disturbingly easy to cause physical destruction in the real world with a computer, right? Um, in the Philippines, you gotta, you guys got like a lot of hydroelectric dams. Like, you know, you, you, you put a big concrete dam in front of a river and then the water going over the dam like spins a turbine and that generates electricity. Y'all got that in the Philippines? Anybody want to want to pipe up and tell me yes, no? So the important thing is kind of two things. Number one, those turbines. You can you can answer.
So those turbines are, are, are big, giant things. They're like, you know, 10,000 pounds or, okay, no, you guys use kilos, don't you? There's some huge number of kilos and they're spinning around at like thousands of revolutions per minute. I mean, these things are really trucking, right? And if they're not balanced exactly perfectly, they would tear themselves apart. And the second important thing is that those, those, the balance of these things, these giant monumental huge hunks of metal that are spinning around at thousands of RPMs, they're balanced by computer networks. So imagine you could break into the computer network of that hydroelectric jam and purposefully unbalance one of those things so that it tears itself apart and essentially would cause the equivalent of a giant explosion on the inside of one of these dams. And hopefully this giant explosion would only cause a few million dollars worth of damage, maybe kill a couple of people. Worst case scenario, it breaks the dam. And now you've got a lake's worth of water rushing downstream, killing who knows how many more people, right? And that's the kind of thing that's nowhere near out of the, the realm of possibility for cybercrime. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Good. You guys have have a lot of hydroelectric dams in the in the Philippines. Yes, sir. We have. Yeah, I, I got one. Like, I'm a block away from a river, and there's a there's a, a big giant hydroelectric dam about ten miles upstream. So I'm particularly vulnerable to this kind of thing. Um. So policing cybercrime, right? Uh, what do we got to worry about? What are what are the challenges for trying to catch the bad guys? Well, we've already talked about underreporting and jurisdictional issues, right? Uh, if I'm a, a police officer here in the United States and the bad guys in Germany, what am I going to do, right? Um, so another thing, public desire, right? Public, you know the the there's all kinds of public outrage about sexual assault and murder and drug dealing and all those things. Rightfully so, those deserve to have public outrage. Uh, but there's not a lot of public outrage and demand for change and demand for increased policing for cyber crimes. Even though cyber crimes are way more financially costly than things like bank robbery and, and burglary and you know crimes like that, uh, People don't connect with it and complain about it and, and have that big kind of public upswelling of, we need you to do something about this, like we do for traditional crimes in the real world. Um, investigations are really difficult, right? With a burglary, it's relatively straightforward. You show up, uh, you know, you take some fingerprints. You take pictures of the crime scene, like cops know how to do that. They've been doing that for a hundred years. But with computer crime, it's a lot more complicated. You gotta know, you gotta know how to how to trace IP addresses and you gotta find logs and then sort through the logs and figure out what's important and what's not. Um, and all of those investigation things take take they take a lot of money and time for both the computers. And, and other technological resources to do the investigation and the training to teach cops how to investigate, right? One of the biggest costs for any law enforcement agency is training. And training people to do fingerprinting and photographing and, you know, pull over cars and do, you know, that's kind of the normal everyday expected stuff that cops have been doing forever. But training cops on how to do you know, a network intrusion investigation is going to take a lot more time, a lot more energy. People don't kind of just know how to do it because they got trained to do it 30 years ago. It's new, it's different, it's expensive, right? And then there's, you know, kind of putting all of those, uh, the last four in together, there's not a lot of upper level support from politicians, from police captains and chiefs, from anybody in the kind of upper levels of the hierarchy of whatever organization you're talking about, there's not a lot of support for this. Because again, most of those guys are pretty old. They've been around since, you know, fingerprinting was new. And 
they don't they don't see the kind of need for spending all this money and time and and focusing on this crime that again the public doesn't care that much about and it's going to cost us a lot of money to investigate this and oh we got to you know the bad guy we caught the bad guy and he's in germany oh my god the extradition process is going to cost a billion dollars we're you know we're not we're not even going to I'm not going to worry about that we're not going to um kind of kind of spend our time and energy and very limited budget on these cyber crime issues and then you know combined with the jurisdictional issue there's if the offenders in one country and the victims of another you got to do extradition you got to send the bad guy from whatever country they're in to your country and that is a long time consuming and expensive process even if your countries are the best of friends right so the united states and the philippines we got a pretty good relationship you know political wise right you know our president and your what do you got president prime minister president right our president your president you know our gov my government your government we're they're on pretty good terms and even then it would take a lot of time and a lot of money to ship a criminal from one country to the other now imagine it's you know the united states and china or the united states and russia really not on good terms right now right so even if we figure out exactly who did it if they're in a country that that our country isn't really on the best of terms with it's going to be you know the 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 international process of of making that person kind of face justice is just going to be way too complicated and expensive and and um difficult and so we're, nobody's going to waste time on it so this is the message i'm going to leave you with i'm 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 probably over my time limit at this point so this is the last slide i promise um so these are the two big lessons i want you to walk away from this with all right these are the two if you only remember two things from this full presentation this is what i want you to remember number one computers and networks are really complicated these are not easy things i mean i thought they were complicated back in the 80s but those computers back in the 80s have nothing on the giant complicated hardware and software and networks and, and the internet and all those things now, it has gotten exponentially more complicated. And thus, it's really difficult and time consuming to learn enough about uh, uh, these, you know, the hardware and software and networks to investigate a crime. And even once you've learned enough to investigate it, each investigation is going to be really complicated because you have to find all kinds of information in a giant sea of information. Every computer, from my computer to your computer, to, to your school's computers, to the computers at NASA, every one of them is gonna have literally a billion things going on at any one time. And you've gotta go in and out of those billion things, pick out the 10 or 15 that are evidence of a crime. And that is really difficult. And the second thing I want you to remember, people are stupid and that's usually hopefully thankfully the bad guys they're going to do something stupid and they're going to leave a trail and you're going to be able to catch them so it's going to be complicated it's going to be difficult you're going to be able to catch them but the other thing you got to worry about is that a lot of times the victims are victims because they're stupid you can you know if i run a company and I have the best ever cybersecurity policies and rules, and my employees have to do this, and they have to, and they have to have really great passwords, and they have to have, you know, we got firewalls, and I pay my cybersecurity staff a million dollars a year. There's still gonna be some employee that clicks the wrong link on some email and infects the entire company with a virus. This, this happened to my wife recently. She worked at a hospital and uh, somebody opened an email they shouldn't, downloaded a, 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 you know, clicked a link or downloaded a program or did something they shouldn't do. And the entire hospital got hit with ransomware. So nobody in the entire hospital was able to use email. They weren't able to use the internet. All Their whole computer system was down for like two weeks because somebody in some part of this hospital click the wrong button. So it's not just about having rules. It's not just about having policies. It's not just having about having a really good cybersecurity team. 
It's also about making sure every single person in your organization from you know the lowest paid temporary worker all the way up to the CEO knows what they're doing, knows at least the basics of cybersecurity and how to protect yourself from cybercrime and make sure that they're not clicking the wrong link. They're not responding to the wrong email. They're not doing those stupid things that you know, we kind of all do at some point in our lives, but we need to minimize it to make ourselves less good or less attractive of a target. All right, so that's the end. This is my contact info. That's me, Kevin W. Jennings there at the top. There's my email address. It's just kevin.jennings at lmunet.edu. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube. I got a whole YouTube channel. It's called Arresting Developments. Um, and on that YouTube channel, I actually have a, a cybercrime course that I, I recorded. It's like, I don't know, 11 or 12 hours worth of, of lecture videos. Um, you're welcome to watch that, uh, use it for your own purposes, uh, you know, whether it's just because you're interested or you need a, a backup to your, to your cybercrime class that you're taking in college or whatever. Share it with your friends. Uh, you know, do it's all out there for you guys to use. Oh, um, I've got uh, uh, oh, dang. No, I, I hit the wrong button and closed the slide. But anyway, um, I've got a, a, a couple other criminal justice classes on there too. If you wanna, if you're interested in, uh, you know, I've got my intro to CJ and I've got criminology and human rights and stuff. But anyway, would totally appreciate it if you uh, looked me up on there and told me what you think. But anyway, that's my time. Uh, I think we're going to open it up for questions now. Is that the, the plan? Do we still have time? I'm sorry. I, I think I went a little over. So thank you, Sir Jenny, for the elaboration of our seminar workshop. So at this juncture, you are free to, to raise your questions or clarifications if there's any. Just raise your hand and then the moderator will entertain your questions. And I got to warn you, you know, these these subjects are super in-depth and complicated. I could do probably five semesters worth of, of kind of what all this is about. So this this, you know, this is an hour. This is the the teeniest, tiniest little bites of each of these different subjects. Um, so, yeah, there's there's so much more. Um, but, you know, I only had an hour, so I don't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too mad at me that I didn't talk about your favorite subject enough. Again, for questions, you can raise it freely or you can comment it in the comment section. The participants can use the Q&A tab for their concerns, clarifications, and questions. I got to say, this is the first time I've done a Zoom webinar. Usually, it's just like a Zoom meeting. And this is kind of nice. I like this, you know, where there's, you know, there's the participants and the panelists and all this. This is really cool. You guys got this going on. Yes, it's better than the uh, seminar type. Oh, we got one. Does being a Napster considered a hacker? Well, so, I mean, it, it, it just kind of depends on how you're defining hacker. Everybody, everybody uh, uh, defines being a hacker in a different way. So for some people, you have to have, you know, broken into a major uh, computer network to be a hacker. For other people... You know, you could you could just write a, a computer virus and be a hacker. For some people, uh, you know, anybody who commits any kind of crime on the internet uh, is a hacker. So, you know, the law doesn't distinct or the law, at least here in the United States, doesn't define the term hacker. That's that's more of a 
you know, just a common English usage word. It's not a legal term. Therefore, it's kind of up to the speaker to define what they mean when they say hacker. And, and everybody you ask is going to give you a slightly different definition. So that's kind of the, the you know, I know that's not a, the best answer to that question. You probably still, um, uh, you know, aren't happy with that as an answer, but that's kind of how it is, right? Uh, we got another one here. Uh, okay, so somebody asked not through the Q&A process. You're supposed to go through the Q&A process, I think, but all right, they, they sent it in the chat. Says, what can individuals and businesses do to protect themselves against cybercrime? And what are some best practices for staying safe online? Okay, so the good news is this is basically the same answer for these two different questions, all right? And here's what I'm going to tell you. If I ever own a business, or if I'm the president of a university, or I'm at the head of any kind of organization, and I get to make these decisions, here's what I'm going to do, okay? Step one, I'm going to take the password file from my organization, where everybody's username and password are kept. And I'm going to have somebody whose entire job it is to try and crack those passwords. And we didn't get into, you know, that's that's a little bit more of an advanced thing. If, please invite me back and I will give you an entire hour long lecture on passwords and how they work and, and how password cracking works. You know, in theory, I'm not going to teach you to actually do it. But I'll teach you the theory and, and kind of the, the reasons why you shouldn't use the word password as your password. But I would have somebody whose entire job it was to try to crack those passwords, to try to figure out what the, the, the encrypted, encoded version of your password actually is. And if they can figure out what it is, if they can crack your password, you got to change it. I don't care if it's been 10 minutes or 10 days or 10 years since you created this password. If we can crack it, you got to change it. If we can't crack it, you can keep it for as long as you want. No more of this, you know, changing passwords every three months or six months or whatever. That's that's silly. That's terrible policy. But if we if the guy I hire to crack all our passwords is able to crack your password, you got to change it. If they can't crack your password, keep it as long as you want. The second thing I would do is have uh, like sting operations. I would send out my own phishing emails to people saying, hey, this is so-and-so with such and such bank, or, uh, you know, I need you to, to click this link and, uh, you know, uh, or input this username and password or whatever. And then if they fall for it, if they, if they click the link, if they download the file, if they put in their username and password, mandatory training right? You have to go through another training process to teach you why you should not click that link or put in your username and password in situations like that. And again, I don't care if you went through that training last week. You do the wrong thing again, you got to go through the training again. And people, I hope that would teach people uh, uh, to be discerning on what links they click, on what emails they read, on what uh, files they download, all those things. But essentially, I would, I would be kind of a pretend bad guy or hire somebody to be a pretend bad guy um, to, to um, attack my own company. Uh, and they, they already have companies out there where that's their entire um, uh, business model. Is to, they're called penetration testers, right? So companies will hire these other companies and say, hey, try to attack our company through through the internet or through phishing emails or through this or through that. Um, and then the penetration testing company will go and try to attack those groups um, and then give the company a, a, a kind of a report. You know, here's what we found. Here's how many people fell for our phishing email. Here's uh, the kind of training you should do to make sure it doesn't happen again, all those things. But I would have my own uh, inside my, my own organization, just constantly trying to crack passwords and get people get employees to fall for phishing emails and all those things. Is there any possibility to avoid receiving clickbait links? No, that's, I mean, that's the short answer. Hate to say it. Um, it's a terrible answer, but it's the truth. There's nothing you can do 
to avoid receiving those links. The only thing you can do is just not fall for them. You know, delete them as fast as you can. If it's on some kind of service where you can report posts, report them. Um, see if you can get, you know, if you get it over Facebook, report it to Facebook. Um, uh, but there's not really a lot you can do to prevent pre prevent yourself from being approached as a victim. Hopefully you'll never actually become a victim, but that doesn't stop you from actually receiving the links and the emails and all those things. <laughs> uh how can i know if my messenger is not being hacked oof um it's kind of i mean the short version is you can't you can know if it is being hacked by you know messages that you didn't send being sent out things like that but um you know until somebody uses it for bad purposes there's really no way to tell uh, does breaking the password of your neighbor's Wi-Fi constitute a cybercrime? Uh, I don't know about Philippine law. Uh, here in the United States, it would be technically a crime, but it's low level enough that I doubt anybody would actually prosecute you for it unless you use your neighbor's Wi-Fi to commit some crime. Then that's absolutely part of what they would charge you with. And again, technically, just me breaking into my neighbor's Wi-Fi is a crime, but it's uh, no prosecutor is going to waste their time and energy prosecuting it if that's as far as it goes, right? What Philippine law is, I don't know. I have no idea. You'd have to ask a, a Philippine lawyer. And then uh, over here in the in the webinar chat, it says, what are your thoughts as professor regarding the chat GPT AI being used by students for research and assignments? Oh, man. We could have a whole nother hour long lecture on chat GPT. Um, I mean, that's that's a real complicated thing, but I'm actually head of my school's committee, uh, our technology committee that's kind of been assigned to look at this. So I can tell you this, the good news is there's three or four different really good uh, kind of AI generated text detectors, right? So if you find those, you can put in so what I did when this when this first became a thing, I went to those different detectors, right? And I took text that I know was generated by AI, and I took text that I know was generated by me, and I put them in, put three or four of each kind in and saw how the kind of patterns, the scores, the, the detection algorithm looked at it, right? And there was a really nice cluster. All the AI generated text kind of came over here on this end of the scale and all my text came over here on this end of the scale. And there was no overlap of the two different kinds of text, which is good. They were both very distinct. But now I've, I have enough kind of experience with those detectors that I can, if I think, ah, oh, this student, this student work looks, I, you know, it might be AI generated. I can just take a sample of that text, put it into the detector. And if it's over here, it's probably AI generated. It's over here. It's probably fine. Um, and unfortunately, that's never 100% accurate. So you're going to have to go to the student and kind of say, hey, I have my suspicions. This was generated by AI. Uh, and then sit with them and talk to them and see if they can kind of talk you through how they wrote it, what they wrote, why they, you know, organized it the way they did, all those things. And if they have no answers to any of those questions, it's AI, right? But if they can kind of walk you through, oh, I wrote about this and I wrote about this and I organized it like that and I was really interested in this part of it, that's probably more of a, a false positive for the AI detector, right? Um, but then, you know, here's the good news, right? As professor, I, I don't know how things are there, but here I'm constantly getting uh, uh, students former students and current students asking me to write them letters of recommendation, right? So as a professor, I'm excited for chat GPT because now I can use AI to write those letters of recommendation. <laughs> so there's a benefit to it, right? It's not all bad. It's not all a bad thing. You know, this is, they're, they're, you know, see the silver lining to that cloud, right? All right, other questions. Uh, is there a chance that my deleted videos in my phone can be recovered by a hacker? Yes. If again, if you guys invite me back, you know, 
I'd love to come back. I always love doing presentations for you guys. Um, but I could do a whole uh, hour, two hour, five hour long lecture on digital forensics. And digital forensics is the art of getting, you know, the technical stuff behind getting evidence off of some kind of computerized device, whether it's laptop, desktop, cell phone, whatever. And the short version is, you know, and again, this could be hours long lecture, but the short version is just deleting something off of a computer doesn't mean it's gone. So if the hacker knows what they're doing and they get access to your phone or your computer or whatever, they can absolutely find deleted things. So if you wanna really make sure it's gone, it's not just deleting it that you need to do, you need to overwrite that part of the memory, which you can Google like how to overwrite memory in such and such model phone or whatever and figure it out, but be very careful because you know, if you accidentally overwrite something that you need to keep, it's gone. You ain't getting it back. So be very careful with this. Um, but if you really need to make sure something's gone, that's the way to do it. Just deleting it isn't enough. Uh, what happens if there's a conflict between an internet domain name and existing trademark? I have no idea. That's a, <laughs> that's a civil law thing. That would be somebody suing another person in court, in a civil court. Um, I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, I wish I... I, I Wish I had a friend who was a lawyer here to, to give me some idea, but honestly, you know, I, I wish I could answer that better, but uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, what type of antivirus or programs do you prefer in order to prevent against illegal access or cyber attack? Oh man, again, another long, uh, long answer. Um, the short version is luckily with most operating systems, especially Windows and the Mac OS, they have pretty decent antivirus programs just built in. Um, I've never had, I've never felt the need to pay for extra antivirus. You know, there's a few different programs I download and install that are kind of free to use. Um, one of the things I highly recommend is, um, there's an add on for your browser of choice, whether you use Firefox or Chrome or, or Microsoft edge or whatever, there's a free add on called Adblock plus that blocks ads and pop-ups and, you know, all those things highly recommend that. Um, cause a lot of bad guys kind of get into your computer through some kind of pop-up or ad on, on, on websites. Um, there's also a few different, you know, similar, uh, kind of add-ons to your web browser that do, uh, that prevent, um, uh, like cookies and tracking and, and all that kind of stuff, which is good, not only for privacy, but also security. Um, but honestly, unless you are like a vice president at a bank or the president of your university or something, you really don't need to pay for any extra antivirus stuff. Just make sure the stuff that comes with the products you're using already is enabled. Make sure you listen to it. Download some free add-on stuff for your browser or your email client. That's really all you need. Unless you're some specific target, you don't need to pay any money for that kind of thing. Is cyber terrorism only for the government or is it also for the general public? Absolutely for the general public also. It's for everybody. Cyber terrorism can affect anybody. Um, again, if somebody, you know, somebody hacks into the dam five miles upstream from me and causes a giant explosion, I could have Norris Lake in my backyard or even worse in my living room. So that's absolutely a, a problem for me, right? Unfortunately, it's it's going to be mostly the uh, either the government or the the people who actually work at the dam to prevent it. But if you're working at a police station, you know there's cyber terrorist stuff that they could get into in your computer. So so it's your responsibility to help protect your organization from that. If I work at a at an oil pipeline. It's my responsibility to protect that oil pipeline from being attacked by cyber terrorists and leaking a thousand gallons of oil into you know, a, a farm fields or national forests or whatever, right? So uh, if, if by saying is cyber terrorism only for the government or is also for the general public, if you mean who's gonna be the victim, absolutely everybody. If you mean whose job is it to protect everybody, it's both, the the um both the government and the people working at all these facilities my wife works in a hospital 
So it's her job to protect that hospital from cyber attack. Because if she, you know, um, there's all kinds of, of ways you could kill people, like literally kill people using a cyber attack against the hospital. So it's, it's part of her job uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. Oh man, okay. This is this next one's gonna be gonna be uh, uh well both of the next two. These are gonna be a tough one. How do we know if there is an act of cyber warfare and has cyber warfare occurred in every country? Oh, that is a long, complicated answer. So the short version is, uh, uh, we don't know. We don't know. Sometimes one country attacks another in an act of cyber warfare, and it's really obvious. But it's not always on. And even when we can figure out, like, oh, man, that was a, a Russian hacker that attacked us. A lot of times we figure that out, like, two months afterward, when it's far past time to kind of retaliate in real time, right? Or um, maybe we never figure out who it was. We know somebody attacked us. We might su you know, suspect it was China or or Russia, or, you know, whoever, but we never get solid enough proof to ever actually do anything about it, right? And I'm, I will guarantee you, I will, I will put every penny I own uh, on a bet that says every country has been a victim of, you know, government intrusion from another country trying to break into private business for uh, you know, blueprints for the latest and greatest technology or trying to steal military secrets or whatever. I, every country on the planet has been attacked like that. A tiny, tiny, tiny percentage has been A, detected, and then B, traced back to the, 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 the country that's doing it. And, and any minor uh, subset of that is going to have enough evidence to actually you know, make a public pronouncement that, hey, China hacked into our government servers. Because unless you are really, really sure, you don't want to say that kind of stuff. So officially, cyber warfare is really rare. Unofficially, I'm betting it happens all the time. We just don't detect it or can't attribute it to a government or a, or a, a military. Right. Does that make sense? All right. I, th I think that's all the current questions. I think I answered them all. Am I am I looking at this list right? I think every question has been answered thoroughly by Dr. Jennings and we shall proceed to the last part of today's seminar workshop, and that is the closing remarks to be given by the College of Criminal Justice Education Governor, Princess Lovely Joy Torres. Uh, I think there's still one more question, Mark. Oh, is there? There's still one can more you, question. Can and you read it question, for me? Yes, sir. The... The question is... Uh, Sir Jennings, there's still one you, more question. How can, a law enforcement, question how can a law enforcement agencies work together to combat cybercrime? And what are some of the most effective strategies for doing so? Oof. It's in the chat. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So what can law enforcement do? Um, I mean... The problem is what they can do is the last thing they're going to actually be able to do. And that's spend more money on the problem, right? We need to have more people hired and trained to investigate these kind of things. And one of the big problems is a lot of the computer nerds, a lot of the exact kind of people coming out of college that we want to hire to be cybercrime investigators are the kind of people who can't get hired by law enforcement agencies because they... You know, they smoke a little marijuana once in a while, or they they committed some really minor misdemeanor crime that's on their record a couple of years ago, or you know, the kind of people who know computers well enough 
to be really effective investigators are the kind of people that law enforcement agencies have rules against hiring. And I think that's really short-sighted and stupid, uh, but that's where we are. You know, I'm personally of the opinion that, you know, uh, if somebody smokes some weed in college, that doesn't mean they won't make a good police officer after they graduate, you know? Um, so they need to hire and train people uh, more people to do the investigations. They need to kind of put more resources towards caring about these different cyber crimes. Um, and, and just kind of, you know, once the generation of police administrators, you know, the old guys with the hair that looks like mine, once their people uh, kind of younger than me who grew up with computers and grew up with cybercrime. Once, once you know, people your age get into the administration, they're going to take it much more seriously because they grew up with it. They know about it. They, they, they have seen it their whole life. But right now, the old guys in administration, you know, when they were my age, when they were your age, you know, crime was murder and rape and robbery and burglary and drugs and the things and they they those are the things they still understand those are the things they still embrace and i'm not trying to i'm not trying to speak bad about these guys i'm not trying to i'm not trying to shame them i'm not trying to make them feel bad i'm not trying to insult them but that's just the you know kind of human nature right things that we didn't grow up with things that we didn't experience things that we have no personal connection to is just naturally kind of less important in our minds right so i think as each generation kind of becomes uh, higher up in whatever organization we're talking about, um, it'll kind of naturally become more of a priority. And then what was the second part of the question again? Sorry. The second part of the question, sir, is, uh, I am still looking at a question. I think it's, answered uh and what are some of the most effective strategies oh yeah for doing okay. so when you when you first read it uh i remembered i had a, a a really important thing to say about that but then i i couldn't remember the second part of the question so the second part of the question the answer there is education 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 everybody from you know kindergarten students to college students to you know, uh, employees of a company to police officers, to news reporters, to politicians, everybody needs to be more educated about these issues, understand what phishing is and what fraud is and what, you know, all these different things, because the more we know about it, the more we understand it, the more we embrace it, the more we see it, the more we're gonna be able to protect ourselves, the more we're going to be able to write good laws, the more we're going to, you know, create policies in our agency that are that that help protect ourselves and others, right? So it's just education, education, education. Read about it, watch YouTube videos about it. And again, arresting developments, my YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe. Um, just the more people we can educate about the subject, the better everybody's going to be. Mr. MC? Hey, thank you so much, sir, for the clarification. And now there's one question here, sir, just to clarify about the distinction or the difference between cracking and hacking, sir. Can you please elucidate the cracking and hacking, sir? Crack if there's... So originally, hackers were just people on computers. If you, if you were good with computers and you could do make computers do things that other people couldn't do, you were called a hacker. <laughs> then in like the 80s and 90s, they started using hacker as a term for computer criminal because a lot of the people who were hackers and could make computers do cool things decided to become criminal. So the term hacker kind of, kind of became synonymous with computer criminal. Then in the 90s, they tried, they really attempted to do a, a kind of a, a public relations shift. 
and change it so that hacker was no longer uh, synonymous with criminal. So they introduced this new descriptor, this new name, cracker. And that's, you know, the crackers are the subset of hackers that are criminals, right? And so there was a, a kind of a concerted push in the community to create this distinction between hackers who are just really good with computers and might be criminals, but most aren't, with crackers who are the criminals and those are the bad guys. But that never really took off. It never really kind of became as culturally, um, as culturally uh, uh, widespread as a lot of the as a lot of the the computer people wanted it to be. So I, honestly, I haven't heard the term cracker in a long time um, because we've gone back to basically just thinking of using hacker as a term that's essentially synonymous with computer criminal. So if you really wanted to get technical about it and and you know go back to that old school '90s, early 2000s terminology, you know a hacker is just somebody who's good with computers, and a cracker is somebody who's who's a computer criminal. Um, but you'd be one of the very few who make make that distinction at this point. Thank you so much, sir, for your, the clarification. And now I would like to give this time to Professor John Kailing for his words of gratitude. Uh, once again, everyone, uh, good morning and good evening to you, uh, sir, in your time zone. It's evening. Sorry for uh, waking you at that very time. In, no, behalf no, of, in behalf of Northeastern Mindanao Colleges, uh, headed by our Dean of the College of Criminal Justice Education, Dr. Edwin Montalba, we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Kevin W. Jennings for sharing your expertise in cybercrime investigation. And we are excited, sir, and we are eager to hear more words from you. More insights. Absolutely. So in your in your most convenient time, sir, we can schedule another uh, seminar workshop because just like you, sir, we are we firmly believe that education is the key stone or the very solution to this emerging threat brought by the cyber crime. Yeah, we, uh, we sir, can, we, we can do a whole series. Our, yes, yes, sir, and. And all my students sir, are are now your uh, subscriber in your in your YouTube uh, uh, channel, sir. Yes, they, they watch it, sir. Thank because you. I I will give quiz based on the the clips that you posted on Facebook. So they really <laughs> have to watch. Otherwise, they cannot answer the question that will be. Oh man, that's um, amazing! Thank them. you. <laughs> yes, sir. So they will definitely watch it, sir. Yeah, and, share share it with your friends too. <laughs> yes, sir, of course, of course. And <laughs> as part of our token of gratitude, sir, we will be sending a certificate of appreciation. It will be sent directly to your email, sir, after you, our uh, seminar. We cannot just post it here because it's uh, a confidential, but we yeah. will uh, definitely send it, sir, in your email after this one, sir. Absolutely. Thank you Thank so you. much again, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so yes, much. Mr. MC. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Kailing, for those words of gratitude. Again, we, we thank you, Dr. Kevin W. Jennings, for imparting to us your knowledge about cybercrime and hope to see you once again for our another seminar workshop. Definitely. At this point of time, may I call on Princess Lovely Joy Tueres for the closing remarks. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great opportunity for me to close this seminar, the Cybercrime Investigation Seminar, with a theme, Trends and Challenges of Cybercrime in Global Perspective. It made us realize that it is really important um, to know and follow the cybersecurity practices and guidelines and cyber awareness through education for our future jobs and paths to take in the future. And 
in behalf of the College of Criminal Justice Education participants, we would like to thank, first of all, our guest speaker, Dr. Kevin W. Jennings, for sharing his knowledge and expertise in this field. Also to our generous sponsor, the Chapter House Incorporated, and to the excellent Dean of the College of um, Criminal Justice Education in Northeastern Mindanao Colleges. Also our very initiative um, advisor, Mr. Johnny Ray Kailing. And to our dear participants, I hope that you have learned a lot in this um, seminar. So with honor and gratitude, um, I am closing this program. Thank you. Mr. MC, that ends our program, please. So again, once again, thank you, Chapter House. Thank you, Dr. Jennings. And thank you, Dr. Edwin T. Montalba. And thank you, CCGA Department of Northeastern Mindanao Colleges. Until our next seminar workshop, Sir Jennings and students. Thank you. And that would be all for today. Guys.